This morning we're in uh, Mark chapter 12, if you'd like to turn that up in your Bibles, or actually I guess it's going to be on the screen as well. Uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. I won't take it personally if you're all looking this direction now, because <laughs> I looked up a couple of times, why is everybody looking up here? I forgot the screen was behind me, so it'll take some getting used to. Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 40. And what we have here is really a summary of what we've just read in Matthew chapter 23. So try to bear some of that in mind as we uh, read this particular passage and as we go through uh, this subject. We read in Mark 12, beginning in verse 38. And in his teaching he was saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and chief seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets, who devour widows' houses, and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now we do need to realize that uh, Jesus is warning us of, of a particular sin that we might say is um, unusually obnoxious in his eyes and in the sight of God. Notice he says that those who practice these things will receive greater condemnation. Is it, is it possible that some are going to be judged more severely than others? Is it, some, is it true that some are going to suffer a greater punishment in hell than others? Well, absolutely. And it depends on a number of things, but especially a hypocrite who knows the truth, who knows what they ought to be doing, but don't do that, but instead do something evil in its place while pretending to be godly. The people in uh, Capernaum were guilty of, of a serious sin, which Jesus said was more serious than the sins committed in Sodom and Gomorrah, which we look at as some of the most, you know, the, the grossest moral sin. But they were guiltier because of the kind of sin they committed rejecting Jesus Christ, rejecting him in, in light of the fact he preached in their streets, in light of the fact that he actually did miracles that they saw, they had greater light. And they rejected that light and they were judged for it more severely than Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus says in the day of judgment. And what about these scribes and these Pharisees who are experts in the word of God, I mean, who know what it is that God wants them to do, but who not only don't do it, they, they they do just the opposite, but pretend at the same time that they're doing God's will and perhaps even you know, believing themselves that they are pleasing to him. That's the kind of hypocrisy that the Lord is warning us against this morning. Now we'll notice that uh, Jesus in this particular part of his ministry is in his last week. The triumphal entry has already taken place. There's only a few days before his crucifixion. We've seen a bit of the interchange between Jesus and his opponents as they were looking for a way to try to trap him, and accuse him, and do away with him. Well, Jesus, now having fielded several questions from them, uh, has gone, we might say, on the offensive, and he has begun uh, not only questioning them, but also teaching them things that they need to know before he leaves. And, of course, we saw the first question, which was meant to try to provoke them, to see who it is the Messiah actually is through the question, if Messiah is David's son, why does David call him Lord? We saw that the Jewish leaders didn't like this question because they didn't understand the answer. I mean, how could Messiah be greater than David if David is his father? How can he be greater than the greatest king that God had ever given to Israel, the one with whom he actually made this covenant? And why did he give this promise to the Messiah that he would subdue all of his enemies under his feet? Well, not only did this imply that Messiah is in fact God, but it also indicates that if Jesus is the Messiah, then they soon would be subdued under his feet, and they didn't like this. Well, that was the one offensive thing, and in, in you know, not offensive, it was offensive and offensive, if you get the, uh, the difference there. Offensive to them, but it was an offensive move on the part of our Lord. Well, we see a second one this morning as he's teaching in the temple, having to do with the scribes, where he tells those he's teaching, do not follow their example because they are hypocrites. 
Now, on the surface, it may not seem like uh, this particular principle would have much application uh, in the church today because we don't have too many scribes and Pharisees walking around, or do we? I think uh, the point that we want to see this morning is that there are a number of them in the church, and we need to watch out for them. As a matter of fact, we're going to be looking at some more this evening as we consider the, uh, the health and wealth movement and what it is that the gurus behind that movement are doing and why it is they're, they're wrong. But I would say they fall into this category that Jesus is warning us about, and there are others who do as well. So I want us to consider two things this morning. First of all, what it is that Jesus is warning us against. And then to look at two applications that we ought to beware of the hypocrites, but we also need to watch out in ourselves for the same kind of hypocrisy, because we can be guilty of the same thing. And God doesn't like it. We need to repent of it. So first of all, what is Jesus, uh, Jesus warning us against here? Well, Jesus is, ad is addressing, again, the scribes. And again, from Matthew 23, you understand that it's the scribes and the Pharisees. Scribes actually were Pharisees, but they were like a subset within the Pharisees. These were the ones that I've mentioned before who were the students of Scripture, the ones who copied the Scriptures, the ones who knew the Scriptures, and who taught the Scriptures. They're also called lawyers because they became experts in law. And that would be, of course, God's law. And these were the ones who also were guilty of adding their tradition to the law. Now, not all the scribes were as bad as, as each other. There were, of course, differing levels of badness, you might say. Jesus just spoke to one who, in his study of Scripture, had actually come up with the truth, knowing what the greatest commandment was, knowing what was behind all the commandments, to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. But he was exceptional. Jesus saw in him an intelligence that he didn't see in, in all of the scribes. But for the most part, Jesus is grouping them all together. And he says, watch out for them because they are hypocrites. Now do what they say if what they say agrees with the word of God. As he says on another occasion, they, well, we already read in Matthew 23, they sit in the seat of Moses. They are the teachers of Israel. And when they speak to you from the scriptures and they tell you what God is actually saying, you do need to submit to that because it is God's word and because of their office, because of their authority. But don't do what they do because they say one thing and they do another. That's the essence of hypocrisy. Now, again, we saw several things in Matthew 23, but Jesus boils it down to just a couple of things in, in this, well, in, in Mark's gospel. What was it they were doing that was so hypocritical? Well, they walked around, first of all, in long robes. So what's wrong with walking around in a long robe? Maybe they, they liked having the extra length. Maybe kept their legs clean from the soil on the street. Well, no, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about this ceremonial lengthening of their garments, the uh, the sewing of a blue ribbon around the edge and the lengthening of their tassels, uh, which were all meant to do something that was, in essence, good, uh, to remind them to keep the commandments of God. That's what the blue ribbon and the tassels were for. But the problem was it didn't just do that for them. It also gave them a reason to become prideful, thinking that they were better than others just because they wore these things thinking that they were more devoted to the Lord because they went this extra step and put these reminders on their garments. Same thing with the broadening of their phylacteries and so forth, putting the commandments in this leather box that they wore on their forehead to remind them to keep the commandments of God. It's not wrong, of course, to remind yourself. I mean, people sometimes wear things to remind them of their devotion to the Lord. Perhaps they'll wear a cross. I don't know. Perhaps they have a fish or whatever it may be. There's nothing wrong necessarily with those things. It depends on what they're used for. If you glory in it, if you wear like this huge cross so that people know that you're some kind of a super Christian and you are prideful about that, well, that's, that's wrong. There was one prominent uh, Christian leader, teacher in the church. Uh, we wouldn't exactly agree with him on all his theology, but we respect a lot of the things that he had to say. He used to wear this huge wooden cross 
on a chain. And when he was asked why it is he wore it, he said, because demons don't like it. Well, okay, so his reason for wearing it was not to stand out as a super Christian, but he thought if he wore this, it would ward off demons. You know, I, I don't know. But uh, that, that, in that case, we'd say, okay, well, that wasn't quite so bad. But if you think by wearing these things that you are a better Christian than others, you see, that's prideful, that's hypocritical, and God hates that. He goes on to say that they liked respectful greetings in the marketplace. They liked to walk out in public places so that when people saw them, they would honor them. And when people saw the scribes and Pharisees walking in the marketplace, they would give them expressions of honor, stretching out their hands to them, uncovering their heads, you know, taking your hat off, as it were, when somebody comes by, or bowing the knee, or calling them rabbi or teacher uh, as a mark of their education. Uh, these scribes and Pharisees liked the best seats in the synagogue, uh, the seats of honor. In the synagogue, there were the, the people who sat, the congregation who sat out there, but there was a row of seats also in the front where the elders would sit. And if you're sitting in those seats, so the congregation looking forward is looking at you. So again, having the best seats of honor. Uh, they liked the places of honor at banquets. It, when somebody would give a banquet, there were different seats at the table, and it, apparently it was different at different times and in different cultures, whether to sit at the head of the table or to sit at the foot of the table or to sit in the middle of the table. But wherever the seat of honor was, that is where they would sit so that they would be seen to be an honorable person when people came in. Remember on another occasion, Jesus taught his disciples to take the lowest place at the table uh, to humble yourself so that when the host comes in and he sees you sitting there, he may move you up higher and if he does, you'll receive honor in front of all the guests. But if he sees you sitting in a seat uh, and somebody more honorable than you comes in, if you're in a seat of honor, and he tells you to move down lower, you'll be dishonored in front of everyone. So take the lower seat. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees started with the higher seats because they wanted to make sure that they were recognized for who they were. Now, all of this really amounts to pride. And you know what God thinks about pride. They wanted others to think that they were special. They were important. They liked the notoriety. The religious leaders in Israel in those days were the celebrities. They were the celebrities of Israel. Uh, the Jews weren't so much into singers. They weren't into actors, you know, honoring actors or sports figures. Uh, that wasn't the way their culture was orchestrated but rather they honored those who honored the Lord, or at least appeared to, through their study, through their dedication, through their separation from the world, through their teaching and various other things. They honored those who at least appeared to be honoring the Lord. But as you know, these were not doing that. These were self-made individuals, self-made celebrities. They liked the attention, they liked <coughs> the praise, they liked to be recognized by others. Again, these are the celebrities of Israel. Now, we could follow this line of thought to point out the sin of the celebrities of our own day who are seeking great things for themselves, to be known by others, to be praised by others, to be honored by others, to be remembered when their lives are over who use their gifts, as we saw on another occasion, to draw attention to themselves rather than giving glory to God. But instead of going that direction, I think we need to continue to go in the direction that Jesus is already going as he is addressing this problem within the church. Sometimes we think of you know, the scribes and the Pharisees and the people of Israel as like the enemies of God. And for the most part, they were because they were unconverted. But don't forget, they were the church at that time until the Lord, of course, brings his people out of the old covenant church to establish his new covenant church. And he's not putting off, you know, plan, plan A to go to plan B necessarily in a certain sense. It's sort of the fulfillment of everything that the Lord had promised to the old covenant church. Now, there's a couple of problems that Jesus is addressing here. 
The first is pride. They wanted notoriety for themselves. But the second one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in the sense that they were wanting to appear as very religious people while being guilty of very serious sins. Now, Jesus only mentions two, but again, I would remind you of what Matthew 23 said. The two he mentions here are devouring widows' houses and secondly, for the appearance sake, offering long prayers. First of all, they took advantage of widows. Now, if you were to ask the question, who is it that God was most concerned about in, in, in his own people? In, in uh, you know, again, uh, in Israel, who were the ones he'd be most concerned about? It would usually boil down to two. It would be orphans and widows. And I think widows, even more so than orphans, at least orphans, you know, at some point are going to be able to support themselves. But widows, if they're beyond a certain age, are left entirely on their own, especially if they don't have family members to take care of them. Uh, they don't, they're too old to get married to have a husband to take care of them. And in that culture, there wasn't much that a woman could do to take care of herself. Well, they took advantage of these widows who were left alone in the world, who had no one to care for them. They stole from them and took what little they had to live on. Uh, Josephus tells us they even sold their prayers to others, uh, something actually that goes on today. I will pray for you if you, you know, God's going to listen to me because I'm super spiritual. So you give me your money, I'll pray for you. Well, that's one thing that they were doing, apparently, as, long as, as well as making longer prayers uh, to appear righteous. But Adam Clark, quoting Josephus or summarizing Josephus, says this. He says, this sect, says Josephus, pretended to a more exact knowledge of the law, on which account the women were subject to them as pretending to be dear to God. And when Alexandra obtained the government, they insinuated themselves into her favor as being the exactest sect of the Jews and the most exact interpreters of the law. And abusing her simplicity did, as they wanted, remove and dispose, bind and loose, and even cut off men. They were in vogue for their long prayers, which they continued sometimes three hours that perhaps they sold them as do the Roman priests their masses or pretended others should be more acceptable to God for them. And so might spoil devout widows by the gifts or salaries they expected from them. So again, Clark is pointing out what Josephus is pointing out, a couple of specific incidences where these scribes took advantage of widows, took advantage of others, seeking to profit uh, from their destitution from their problems. Now, what did Jesus tell his disciples to do regarding this, this hypocrisy? He said, first of all, that they should beware. They should watch out for them. They should guard their hearts that they should not follow that same example of hypocrisy. Now, what I'd like to do is now understanding what it is they were doing, I'd like to apply this to uh, our situation today uh, in the church, uh, in the church at large, not this particular local congregation, but uh, the church in its larger context, as well as uh, this church and, and ourselves as particular individuals. First of all, we need to ask the question, since Jesus says, beware of these, because they are going to receive a greater condemnation. Are there people that we should beware of for the same reason? Is there anybody in the church today that is like these? Well, let's think about it. Let's ask the question. Is there anybody that we know of? I'm, and again, I'm not necessarily going to name names or point fingers, but let's just think about this conceptually. Are there any in the church who want to be thought highly of? Are there those who want to be looked at or thought of as godly, more godly than others, or more spiritual? Are there people who want to be recognized and treated with greater honor, and yet whose teachings are at the same time leading people astray, telling them to send them their money, promising to pray for them so that God will bless them uh, if they do? Now, I don't know if you've uh, gone to a Christian bookstore lately and looked at 
some of the titles. And by the way, I want to be careful here because I'm not saying everybody who wrote a book is bad. Or everybody who's on the radio is necessarily bad. Or those that show up on television are necessarily bad. But are there any that are in the bookstore, in, on the radio or on the television, that actually fall into this particular category? When you uh, pull up their websites, I mean, whose, whose faces do you see? Whose face do you see on television? Whose name do you hear on the radio? And so forth. Who, who is receiving the honor or the glory for what it is that they are doing? And when you see people following them, you know, who is it that these people are actually following? Now, again, I'm not saying that everybody is like this, but there are so many that are in this uh, public arena that are like this. People who want to get rich, people who want to be well-known and well-regarded, people who want to be remembered in history to make their mark on history. Now, what does Jesus say about people who do these things? Well, if this is what they are, in fact, seeking, they fall under his condemnation. Again, we read about it in Matthew 23, but we also see it in this idea of seeking recognition even among the, the apostles. Remember, they had that dispute themselves. Which of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And they began arguing amongst themselves, no, it's me, no, it's me. Not, oh, it's you, it's you, you know. They weren't doing that, but it's me. What did Jesus say to them? You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In God's kingdom, it is just the opposite. It's not those who try to make a great name for themselves, not those who put their faces out there and so forth, not those who are seeking to be honored by men who are going to be honored by God, but those who virtually become invisible and seek to give all the glory to God, who seek to become the servant of others, who make themselves nothing. Because that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. I mean, what is uh, Paul talking about in Philippians 2 when he says, being in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant, became in the likeness of sinful man, and even went as far as becoming a curse on the cross. And it was for that reason that God exalted him above every name that is named. It's because of his humiliation that he was exalted, not because of his self-exaltation, which is what we see going on. Now think about the people that that the church honors historically, as far as um, that we believe to be godly men. Was it those who were seeking great things for themselves? It was actually just the opposite. Those that are worth remembering today as the heroes of the faith are not those who went out looking for a name for themselves or to receive honor from men, but they went out seeking to give honor to Jesus Christ that they might receive honor from him. I mean, those that we remember the most are those that were actually hated the most. Jesus came to his own, and his own didn't receive him. In other words, the whole church, for the most part, hated Jesus Christ. What about Paul's relationship? Was it any better? You, you realize that when he was stoned and when he was beaten with rods and when he went through all these, this whole catalog of things that he tells us about in 2 Corinthians, it was at the hands of the same people that crucified Jesus Christ the Old Testament church. No, Paul wasn't so popular either. What about Luther? Was he a popular figure? Did people love him? You realize the whole church turned against him, declared him to be an outlaw, and wanted to kill him. The Pope sent you know, his, his papal decrees against him, and so forth. Well, Calvin had the same kind of a problem, didn't he? And even George Whitfield, so well loved by the whole English church. Well, no, he wasn't, actually. The English church hated him, and they closed the pulpits to him, and they began to denounce what he was doing, going out and preaching in common fields to common people instead of bringing it into the house of God in order to sanctify that place by preaching. They turned against him as well. 
And I think you know that Jonathan Edwards, whom I so highly admire, was thrown out of his own pulpit because his people could not stand what he was preaching. These people did not seek glory and honor for themselves. They didn't seek to win friends and influence people. They didn't call ministries, their ministries, by their own name. They weren't even popular in their day. Uh, most of them were, were not honored by most men, but they were honored by the Lord. And the reason they were was because they sought to honor him regardless of what people thought about them. Now, these are the godly ones that our Lord is telling us that you should seek to learn from, that you should seek to imitate, not those who are trumpeting, as it were, their own virtues. And by the way, these are also the kinds of Christians that you ought to try to be, that you ought to strive to be, those that draw attention to your Savior, and not to yourselves, not to your own accomplishments. Paul reminds us that we have no reason to take any credit or glory or honor for anything that we do, whether it's in the church or outside the church, for anything we do in our life that's praiseworthy, because what do we have that we didn't receive? Paul says in Galatians 6.14, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The fact is, he realized that uh, if he got what he deserved, he'd be in hell. But God had mercy on him, gave him grace, gave him a position by which he might preach the gospel wherever he went. It was an honor for him to be hated by others, to be beaten by others, to even, some, at one occasion, we believe, even died for the Lord one time and then was raised, and then he died a second time for the Lord. Those are the things that Paul gloried in. Those are the things that he considered to be honorable and badges of Jesus Christ upon himself. It was not that his name was well known and, and well revered and well thought of and people praised him and greeted him wherever he went. That's not what Paul was after. That's not what he got. He didn't take the glory to himself because he realized that all anything good in him came from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to avoid those people, those hypocrites that draw attention to themselves, and we need to avoid being that kind of person. But secondly, and along the same lines, we do need to beware of hypocrisy because that is what is at the root of what's going on here. I mean, these are pretending to be one thing, but they are entirely different within. They're pretending to be godly, and in this case, the scribes, while at the same time taking advantage of those that the Lord tells us we ought to be helping, not hurting, devouring the living of widows. Our Lord is warning us here not to pretend to be a Christian on the outside while nurturing sin, you know, sin on the inside, having a sinful heart, you know, being like whitewashed sepulchers appearing beautiful to men outwardly, but inside being full of dead men's bones and all corruption. You need to realize that you might be able to fool others, but you cannot fool God. You might be able to rub shoulders with believers for a time if for some reason you want to be thought of as a Christian, but you need to realize at the end of the road, if your heart is not changed, if you're no different within than the unbeliever, you're going to end up in exactly the same place that the unbeliever is going to end up, and that is hell. Now, the Lord certainly is concerned about what we do. He wants us to do the right thing, but you need to realize he's more concerned by why we do the right thing. He would prefer that we try to do something right out of a gracious heart and actually fail than do something that's right with sinful motives. Remember what he said to these scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. Woe to you, which means you are cursed, scribes and Pharisees. You're hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Is that pleasing to God? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish. Again, you wash off the outside. You look good outside. But inside, they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. 
you blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Again, it's not so hard to clean up the outside, to clean up the behavior, to go through the motions, to appear righteous to men. But if your heart is unconverted, if your heart is evil, it's not going to make any difference to God what you look like on the outside. As a matter of fact, you're going to be more guilty for it because you know the right thing to do and you're doing it, but again, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. The Lord says you need to clean the inside of the cup out. Clean the inside of the heart so that the outside, your life, will be clean as well. Now this is the only remedy, this is the only solution, the only way to avoid what Jesus says is the greater condemnation for a hypocritical life. You have to come to Christ and have the inside of your life, your heart, your soul, cleaned out by trusting in Jesus Christ. And that has to take place before there will be genuine love, righteousness, goodness within your heart that will work its way out to your life and make you clean or uh, beautiful on the outside as well as on the inside. Now, if that happens to be where you are this morning, if your Christianity is only external, if it's only on the outside, it's only an act, but your heart isn't really in it, which is why you're struggling to try to do spiritual things because you really don't want to do those things unless somebody else is watching and you have some other reason for doing it. If that's what's going on in your life, you need to realize that the only solution is Jesus Christ. You need to come to him. You need to ask him to clean out your heart, to grant to you his Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the only one who can actually effect this transformation. There are many today, even within the church, that believe that we have the power to do that. We have some amount of goodness left in us that, can, that we ought to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and make ourselves acceptable to God. Well, that's not what we can do. The only thing we can do is ask God for his mercy to come in and clean out our hearts and to give to us the ability truly to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and to look to Jesus Christ to transform our lives and to make us what it is he wants us to be. We need to realize that these scribes would never be saved by simply you know, stopping their hypocrisy and beginning to do the right thing because that's all they're capable of doing. That's all that nature will allow you to do. That's all you come into the world with the ability to do. God has to change the inside. And when Jesus tells them, clean out the inside, the same thing that the Lord meant in the Old Testament when he said, circumcise your hearts. You can't do that without his help. That's meant to point you to him and ask him and seek him until he grants to you his spirit that alone can give you that ability that can transform you from within, that can build that fire, as it were, of holy love for the Lord and his ways so that you can live the Christian life and do the things that God calls you to do, but do them this time, not because somebody's forcing you to do them, not because people are watching you and you do it just to keep up appearances, but because you really want to do it. If that's the case, then you'll find yourself in private when nobody else is looking doing the things that God calls you to do. You will spend time in prayer. You will st spend time in, in the Bible. You will do those things that are honoring to God, and you will think the thoughts that are honoring to Him, and you will desire the things that are honoring to Him, and when you find things that aren't, you will deal with them, even in those secret places that nobody else can see. You will want to be a genuine Christian within and without. Only the Spirit of God can work that grace in you. So you need to ask the Lord to grant you the Spirit so that you might. And by the way, all of us as, as believers still struggle with remnants of sin. We still have a great deal of corruption within us. And I'm not meaning to say by this that if you struggle with this at all, you're not a Christian. We all struggle with this. We all like people to look at us and say, oh, you've done a great job, and to pat you on the back and tell you nice things. And sometimes we even do things 
to draw the attention of other people so that they will look at us and praise us for those things. We all have the heart, well, we all have pride. And to some extent, we're all hypocrites too because we know that there are things that we often allow ourselves to do that we should not allow ourselves to do. Even Christians deal with those things and the answer is still the same. We need more of the Spirit of God. We need more of His help. And God has given us the means by which we can get more of His help. We just need to appropriate those things. We need to spend time in those things and do the things that we know will build us up in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the warning this morning is don't be an external Christian only, but be a genuine Christian within. Don't do things to be noticed by other people. Don't feed your pride, but humble yourself and become invisible. Become a servant. Try to honor others. I think I pointed out on numerous occasions. I'm sure you've read it in, in Romans chapter 12. The only thing that God authorizes us to do better than other people, well, two things, I guess. Be a servant, be a better servant than others, but again, don't get into a competition over it. But the thing that we are allowed to seek to do um, that the Lord allows us, as it were, is in a sort of a competition, is to give greater honor to one another. That's what the Lord tells us we may do. So let's try to honor others, especially the Lord, but not draw the honor and glory to ourselves, but rather give it to the one who actually deserves it, and that is the Lord. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and to apply it because we, all of us, need to hear it.